Good morning, everybody. Are we all well? We're enjoying some sunshine today and yesterday. Good. Oh, what can I hear? Having some competition. Well, welcome to church, everybody. So one day this week, I spent the day power jetting my driveway. Has anybody done that? It's not very exciting, is it? I have quite a long driveway, and in my wisdom, I had the drive, had these like stones extended all around my garden. It felt like I was power jetting the M1 by the time I'd finished. So, I put my headphones in, and for the first four hours, I listened to back-to-back -back sermons from last year's AOG conference on YouTube. Now, I didn't have much of a choice because I was wet and all in the stuff and my phone was in my pocket and if I touched my phone, it stopped playing YouTube and, it was, and I had to listen to adverts in between. It was a little bit annoying. But in amongst all that, I got four hours of God talk, so it was really good. Then the next four hours, because I had a bit of a break then, um, I tried to think about what I had heard and sort of weigh things up. But to be honest, mainly I thought about how tedious power jetting actually is. So, but there were some really good, outstanding words given. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to share one with you this morning. Why, why reinvent the wheel? And you know, I can just share one of the really good words, because this was an excellent word given by Alan Hewitt. And he spoke about Jesus being the center. So I thought, oh, this will be really easy, this. I'll just, like, you know, pinch all his words. And it was actually really hard. Because <laughs> how do you condense, like, 45, 50 minutes of really good, solid word into, like, a five-minute instruction? I'm going to give it a go. And I've added a little bit in. It's not all Alan's words. But so he spoke about how Jesus has to be at the center of uh, four things, the centre of the church, the centre of worship, the centre of the gospel, and the centre of our hearts. Because he pointed out that sometimes, often actually, Jesus is pushed to the periphery as something else takes up the centre. Sometimes that something is us. So Jesus, the centre of the church, I'm just going to read this really, really awesome verse from Colossians, because it says, Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Now, sometimes when we hear the Bible being spoken, we tend to like, you know, maybe sort of like zoom out a little bit, but really listen and focus on these words, what the Bible is saying about Jesus. He is a visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him, through Jesus, and was created for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. This is Jesus. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. The encouragement there was to sort of, as a church... We get so easily distracted, don't we? <laughs> About what's important and what's not important. Yeah. Um, as a church, we can get distracted maybe by works or by a, a building. Or, but you know what? Those distractions minimise when we keep Jesus at the head of our church. Jesus, the centre <clears throat> of our worship. We're really blessed in our worship. We've got a really good worship team, haven't we? <laughs> but 
But you know what? We know it's not about us. We know that we choose our songs carefully. We, we're not on a platform. It's our job to lead you into worship, and I hope and pray that that's what we do. But this Alan Hewitt uh, quoted C.S. Lewis, because why does, why does God require so much worship? And uh, what C.S. Lewis pointed out, and also... My sociology teacher pointed this out years and years ago when I did my A-level. If we don't worship Jesus, we will worship something else. Because it is innate in us to worship something. And my teacher gave the analogy of um, some studies. She, re she referred to some studies that compared the actions of football fans um, that compared to religious activity. So people get, you know, get passionate about football and the way they follow football. And it, it, they, it, there's been studies done how they compared that to the passion and the worship that we experience in church. So if we don't worship Jesus, we'll worship something different. But when we worship Jesus, we are worshipping a risen saviour. We're worshipping a God who loves, a God who heals, a God who gives us wisdom, who gives blessing, a God who puts us back together. We worship him in spirit and in truth, with reverence and in fear, in humility, because there is no room for pride in the worship of our God. It's not about us. There's that song, isn't there, that Matt Redman wrote. It's all about, it's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me. And the, the number of people that used to get those words wrong or mixed up. It's all about me, Jesus. It's not about you. That's wrong. <laughs> but it's not about us. It's about exalting Jesus. About placing him in the center. Because what we do then, we surrender to him. And we experience relationship with him. The center of the gospel. You know, there's efforts to dilute the message to make it fit with how people feel today, with today's culture. To fit in with the culture of narcissism. Narcissism. Efforts to bring Jesus into our lives rather than bringing us into his life. Because the message of the cross is powerful and life-changing. And Bob spoke to this about this last week. People need to hear the message of the cross because we've all sinned and fallen short. The penalty of sin is death. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take the sins of mankind upon himself on the, through death on a cross. Not so we can have a better life, but so we can have new life. Because we've been forgiven through what Jesus did for us. And then at the centre of our hearts, because it says, doesn't it, in the Bible, that where your treasure is, then that is where your heart is also. Just like the football analogy, where your passion is, that's where your heart is. So it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind and all your strength and when you do this Jesus is at the center because Jesus was the word at the beginning Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith Jesus is the way the truth and the life and Jesus is the light that leads to life. This is Jesus. This is what happens when we put Jesus at the center. And finally, I was thinking about this, and as I was thinking about it and praying about it, the verse came to mind where it said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Everything. That's not the big stuff. That's the little stuff. And you know why it's the little stuff? Because we are easily distracted by the little stuff. 
So pray about the little stuff. Because this is one way that the devil will take Jesus out of the center. So this morning as we fellowship together, let's make sure Jesus is at the center. The center of our worship. The center of the word. And the center of our lives. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we just want to say thank you. We just want to put you right in the center right now. Right at the head of the church. Right in the center of our worship. Right in the center of the problems that might come and try and remove our focus away from you. Jesus, we speak your powerful name into every situation and we make you the center Jesus, just fill this place with your spirit, with your presence. Lord, we ask this, Lord, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's praise God and worship together. stand together we're going to worship God in the house of the Lord that's what this first song is called the house of the Lord
As we sing this song about what a beautiful name is the name of Jesus. Lord, we're just reminded again, Lord, that you, Jesus, are at the center. And that you, Jesus, have a powerful name that we can speak into and over and through every situation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. You are the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your head and glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Your love was greater. 
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Jesus with the songs that we're singing and the focus here today is on Jesus and who he is and his resurrection and his power and I, and I really want us to be I'm, I'm trying to absorb in my heart my spirit what God would want to say to us today because I really believe that his spirit is here to speak clearly to things that we need to hear the reassurances that we need in our hearts the things that will bring into our hearts and our understanding and what we see and what we're thinking and what we're listening to, that God will put something in our hearts today that will kind of make some sense of all what's happening. And so I believe that we should really be sensitive to God's spirit here today and listen to what he's saying because he's got some good things to say into our hearts, things that we need to hear, things that you need to hear, things that I need to hear. Praise his wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you've chose to send your spirit here today to speak to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We serve the risen Savior. We worship the risen Savior. Yes, thank you, Lord. And we know he's alive because he's in our hearts. Hallelujah. Yes, what yes. a Savior. Thank you, Jesus. do thank you Lord Jesus for what you've done praise you Jesus Yeah. 
we're going to sing this new song that we learned last week and having sang the songs that we've sung so far where we have recognized the power of the name of Jesus and what Jesus has done on the cross for us this is our response when we say Lord send me It's bandaging the broken I'm washing filthy feet Here I am, Lord Send me If it's loving one another Even when we don't agree Here I am, Lord Send me If I'm poor, if I'm wealthy, I'll serve you just the same. Here I am, Lord, send me on the mountain or the valley. I will choose to pray.
we just think about that challenge as we take our seats. That was a good time of praise and worship, wasn't it? We just thank God. Thank you, God, for just being here this morning. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you that you change us, that you change our hearts, you change our situations. Um, we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your life. Is your name. So Bob's going to come and speak to us, so the children want to go to... Sunday school. I'll just pray for Bob. Lord, we're excited to hear your word this morning. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I really pray for Bob, Lord, as you, you bless him and you anoint him. I thank you for his faithfulness to hmm. you, God. I thank you, Lord, that he honours you, Lord, with the words that he brings. Hmm. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that our hearts will be ready and open and ready to receive, Lord, hmm. the, the challenge, Lord, because it's always a challenge. Your word always challenges us, Lord hmm. Jesus. And we just pray that we respond to your challenge this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 Thank you. Praise the Lord. I really believe that God is uh, as prepared this morning of what, what Ruth said, what we sang and everything and hopefully what I say will, will come together and it will have an impact in our lives. It will say something to us, you know. I, I, what, what I'm always blessed with is that God would to speaking personally, put things into my heart that I can then share with you. And then when you start to see the service going a specific way, it, I, I'm usually the first to know that, that God's doing something here and preparing something that, that is of one single theme. And, and he and just starts to get excited. And I do get excited about what God does in my heart. And I pray that what he does in your heart as well. Praise his name. Thank you, Jesus. And I think the theme is, is it's about Jesus, really. It's about who he is. And, and it's got mentioned, Ruth's mentioned it, about him, about him, his resurrection. We've sang it in nearly every song about something to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I'm just going to have, a, have a, a, a gaze around for a moment. And I don't quite know... Jesus said about, about heaven, he said, you know, that, that somebody asked him, didn't he, about, you know, if a man gets married seven times, you know, who's, who's, whose wife will he be in heaven? And, and Jesus said, it's not going to be like that. And so I'm, I'm just pondering now is when we get to heaven, I, I, I think I'll know who you are and I think you'll know who I am. And we will be with the Lord for all eternity in heaven. Now, that is something that really excites me. And, and it kind of starts something that's, that's I, I don't know, because as I look around and listen, uh, and sometimes, I, I don't know, do, do you ever get a bit of despair about what you see, what you hear, what you listen to? And I come back to one solid foundation, and it is Jesus in my life. Jesus in your life, Jesus in our church, Jesus is, is the actual, actual foundations of everything that, that our lives are built up. Because we look around and things change. You know, when, when Jesus said, you know, you build your life on sand and that and things and, and that, and that's sometimes how I look around and you think this, this is just so uncertain. And yet Jesus brings certainty. He brings assurance. He brings everything that I need to enable me to live in a way that, that I can enjoy his blessings and his, and his peace and his contentment. Praise his name. That's nothing to do with what I want to talk about. But anyway, that, that's, some, that's something. 
I do want to talk about something actually that, that is, now I, I might say a few things this morning that, that maybe some newer Christians might not know or might not be aware of, and some of us older Christians will have looked at this and thought about it and, and studied it. So what, what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes today is potentially open up many, many questions and many, many Bible studies. So, uh, but, uh, but I can only touch on some of the conclusions that I'm going to bring out today from the Bible. And I'm going to start by talking about something that's a little bit weird to me, and, and it's a weird to, 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 to all of us, and I'm going to talk just, just for a minute about life and death. Life and death. Now, most people would understand in the human sense that you have life, and you, you, live it to the, you live it to the full, or, or life throws all kinds of things at you. But there's one thing that's certain, is that, I don't want to be too morbid here, uh, and that, uh, but death comes. Death comes. Or life comes to an end. And I, I don't want to be morbid, and I, and I don't want to talk about complicated things, because I don't do either of those things. I don't like morbidness, and I can't do complicated, because, well, I, I just, it would just be too complicated for me to understand. I like to keep it simple. So I hope what I say today is not morbid and it's simple, okay? I've got a friend who's 80 years old. Well, he's a, he's a business guy and we've worked with him, you know, for, for the last 20 years. And he's probably one of the most energetic, healthy 80-year-old guys that I know. You would never believe that he was 80 years old. He doesn't, doesn't need glasses. I, I've never known him be ill. He's, he's always, he's still working. He's planning to retire in, in, in August, uh, June, uh, September of this year. Uh, and, and yet he's still going strong and you meet him and he jumps out of his car and you cannot believe that he's nearly 80 years old. Well, he's 80 in a couple of weeks. And so we have these chats about life and stuff like that. And in, this is what he said. He said, well, he said, I've had a great life. I know that he's had his, his ups and downs, he's had big businesses, he's been very wealthy, he's lost it all, he's, he's, he's you know, and, uh, and that, but he said, he's, he's, he said, I've had a great life, he said, and if I go tomorrow, I've no complaints. That's what he said. So this was on the phone, we have had many conversations. I'll tell you, one, one, one time, a few years ago, we was driving to Barrow in Furness in his car, right? And we were in such conversation, we were driving up the M6, and we're driving along there, uh, and we, you know, Barrow and Furnish, you just after Lancaster, you turn off and you go over there to the, to the west coast. And with that much in conversation, he went, well, oh, I didn't think the turn off for, for Barrow and Furnish was this far up. And when we looked, it was near Carlisle. <laughs> and we had to turn around. We were that deep in engrossing our conversation. We've had some really good conversations. But he said this last week. He said, I've had a great life. Even if I go tomorrow, I have no complaints. And I said, that's great, but then what? But then what? Ah, well. And we had a bit of a chat, you know, about, well, you know, where, you know and, he, and he said, well, you know, I know you believe and I'm not religious and all that stuff. Life and death. Have you ever had a conversation with anyone about that? You know, about, about what, what they think? What happens? But when you believe in Jesus, and I talked last week about believing, when you believe in Jesus, life and death takes on a whole new understanding. It changes completely. Because, I'll add a couple of things, because when you believe in Jesus, you have new life. New life comes. So not only, he said, you know, I've had a great life, but when you have Jesus, you've got new life. And, it's, and he said, his promises, he said, life to the full. And then that's just the start of it. Because after that, you've got eternal life. And those three things totally transform and, and change our understanding. Because not only do you have life, but you have victory over death. Praise the name of the Lord today. And so when you know about Jesus and you believe in Jesus then it's completely different and it takes on a whole new meaning and understanding. I, I, I do get a bit excited and it's a bit weird, but I've never experienced death. So I can't speak from experience. That's what a lot of people say, don't they? They say, well, you don't know. 
You don't know what's on the other side. And I say, no, I don't, because I've, I've never been there. Yeah, you do the accounts of people who've been on, on there and, and they've experienced this white light, and, and, you, you know, and, and that, I'm not disputing any of that. But for me personally, I haven't experienced that. But I know someone who has. I know someone who has been on that side of death and came back to tell us about it. Now, I haven't met him personally, but I have met him personally. How about that? So how does that make sense? Because I've had a, a personal experience of meeting Jesus, and he's come to live in my heart, and he's transformed the way I am in my whole life, and he's given me new understanding. It says in Luke chapter 24, he said, and the angels said to the two ladies, why are you looking amongst the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. You know, we like to talk about, about the resurrection through, at Easter time. And, and we always mention it, of course, because that's the time that we remember that. But, you know, at other times, there's nothing wrong with talking about the resurrection of Jesus and realizing just what happened and the implications and the gravity of the whole thing about, about life and death was changed in that moment of time. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. How amazing a statement is that he is risen. Now, in the natural thinking, and the Bible does on a few occasions, it refers to things that are talking about heavenly things as being nonsense to people who don't understand these things. And when the ladies went back to the disciples, and don't forget they were still living in this, this earthly kind of understanding, they were struggling to understand it, and when they were saying, Jesus is risen from the dead, they said, this sounds like nonsense to us. It doesn't sound like it's something real. But I want to say today that through what I have believed, through what's happened in my heart, through what I have read, through the spirit revelation, I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Praise his name. For me, it's not a debate. It's not an argument. It's not maybe a possibility that he might have just had a snooze for a while and then, and then he suddenly sprang back to life because he was, he was in some kind of trance or, or, or whatever. And that, no, it's not a possibility. It's not even a question. It's not even in doubt at all. Jesus was risen from the dead and thereby conquered death, hell, sin, and everything else that was coming with it. Praise his name. Amen. Corinthians said, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and I 100% believe that. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. So the moment you believed in Jesus... New life came into your, into your living being. And I, I like the way that, that so the, the Bible ref, refers to our bodies as a tent, doesn't it? It says a tent. You've got a tent. And now some of our tents are getting a little bit old and threadbare and, you know, and they're, they're coming apart at the seams. And when you've got that picture in your mind, I can see Jackie looking at Viv there. <laughs> we... we let me say something to people who aren't, who aren't as old as us, you know. There's nothing wrong with getting old. You can't stop it. It's going to come. It's going to happen. But, you know, when you know the Lord in your heart, the joy of the Lord just it doesn't. There are a few aches and pains. You know, the joints aren't as free as they used to be. You don't run up and down stairs like you used to do. Uh, you, when you've sat in the car for two hours, you, you get out. I, I always... I'm fully aware if I've sat in the car for a couple of hours and I pull into a petrol station and I get out and I walk across the forecourt, you feel like you want to go like that, but you're trying not because people are watching, so you're trying to keep your back stiff. And, it, and, it's, uh, you, and by the time you've got to the, to the kiosk, it's all loosened off a bit and you're feeling okay, but... It's what? It's <laughs> But I say, I, I say this, that, that you know, uh, I don't know, the, the, the older we get, I could say this, and this might sound a bit weird because I said I might say a few weird things today, but the older I get, the closer I get to seeing Jesus 
and who he is. And so that's how I feel about when that closing moments of our lives come. Oh, what, what a reassurance. What a reassurance. So I'm going to move on to something else now. Because it says that, that Jesus was raised from the dead. And it says, just as everyone dies, we all belong to Adam. Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. And again, if you put that in the human sense, sounds like that's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. I love it when the Bible says things that doesn't pander to human wisdom. It doesn't, it doesn't give you the, the, the thing to say, let's work this out in a human sense. It doesn't make sense. The whole message of the cross is foolishness to someone, and they dismiss it. It's just something like, well, you know, you, you, you religious people, you can, you, can, you can lean on that. You know, or, or you know, you can, you can find that. It's, it's kind of some kind of thing, but it's really, it's a lot of nonsense. Well, I think there's enough people here to say that I've lived it in my life long enough to know that it's not nonsense, but it's the truth. And the truth has put a freedom in our hearts, in our spirits, a hope, a something there that you could never find anywhere else. And it's through Jesus as what he's done. And all this is based on what Jesus has done. But, you know, he went on to say that in, in Corinthians, he said, he said, but there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised from the dead, and all who belong to Christ will be raised. Now, I met with somebody this week, and, and we, 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 we've known each other for like near 50 years, Christian. And we grew up in Denton Church, and we started saying a few names that, that were names from the past. Mrs. Buchanan, uh, you know, and Mrs. Mrs. Kidd, Mrs. Hilton. We're saying, you know, and, and I just, they're all dead. Well, they were all then. Well, well yeah, yeah, don't pinch my line. And when we said their names, Mrs. Buchanan, I just wonder, I just don't, I just wonder if Mrs. Buchanan, who's been rejoicing with the Lord for the last 50 years, went, oh, they're talking about me. <laughs> They've just mentioned me. And I can't help but think of, um, you, you know, some of you know my dad, who, who, who loved the Lord with all his heart and, and joy, his mom, and, and so many people that we've known who have gone on, and we love this phrase, who have gone on to be with the Lord. They are with the Lord. I believe how the Bible, and you know, sometimes the Bible, it, it kind of lays it out, but it doesn't, it kind of leaves a little bit of, of what could you say, not, not scope, but it, it's, if it was so categoric, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be categoric with it. But you know, God, God has revealed this to men who have, through the Holy Spirit, have written it down and, and that, and, and they have, let us know a bit of what's going to happen. And he says there, there's an order of this resurrection. So first of all, before this next bit, I want, I want to sort of make sure and be emphatic here is that if we know Jesus Christ in our lives and if we live our lives and come to the end of it in this world now, that we will go to be with the Lord. And, that, and so our, our soul, our spirit, however, our heart, whatever you want to say, and this is what I'm saying, I'm going to keep it simple because there's people who've studied this and they can give deep theological explanations of all of these things. I'll keep it simple. And that is that, that this body will be lowered into the ground, but my spirit will go to be with the Lord. That's the best and simplest explanation that I can give you. And that's what I would say to you, that although our bodies might get lowered in the ground, that our spirits will go to be with the Lord. But he talks here about, about a resurrection, and I believe there's a resurrection. I'm not quite sure, I'll be honest here, I've looked at this for a long time, I'm not quite sure it says, it says that, uh, that the, the dead in Christ will, will be raised. I'll get to that in a minute, but I just wanted to read this first because I'm getting ahead of myself, because I'm excited about what I'm talking about here, okay? It says that those who belong to Christ will be raised and this is the words that jumped out at me when he comes back. When he comes back. What do you mean, when he comes back? Now, if, if we were, again, this is, this is going back to this, going to sound like nonsense, this. But I believe this. 
that Jesus, who came into this world to save us from sin, will come again into this world. I believe that he is coming back. I'm not sure when it will be. It doesn't say you don't know when it will be. But it says this in Acts. It says, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. And he'd been around for, I don't know, was it about 50 days or something like that? And 500 people had seen him. And he was being taken into heaven. And the angel said, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Now that's clear enough for me, that's good enough for me, that Jesus will come again into this world, but he won't be born as a baby. It said in the same way that you saw him ascend into heaven, he will come down into this world. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? I remember that again, going back to, back to my mum uh, or to my parents, uh, I remember as a young boy going to school and that, and, and my mum said, you know, Jesus could come today. And I'd say, right. And then I, off to school I went. Because she was living in that faith and, and, and on the authority of the Bible that Jesus is coming again. And you could look at many things and, he, and you could just put one word into it. He said he's going to come when you least expect it. So if, if we analyze all the things that are said in the Bible, and I'm going to read a couple of things. Do you mind if I read a couple of chilling things? This is Jesus himself saying this. It's Jesus, right? So if Jesus said it, and, and I, 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 you notice the theme this morning is Jesus. Who he is. What he said. How he went about what God had sent him to do. And so one day, Jesus was sat on the Mount of Olives. And his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when will all these things happen? What, what will signal the return and the end of the world? If you read some of the signs, events and anguish that will be happening in the world, which needs some discernment and understanding about what Jesus said in Matthew 24. And you could be unsettled by it, except you've, you've got this, this secureness in your heart and spirit. You know, that as long as I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, as long as my faith remains in him, I have no fear of these things. But I'll just read a clip of it. If you want to read, I've got, a, there's a couple of bits of homework from today, if that's all right. Yep. You can read that, Matthew chapter 24. But in, 20, in verse 29, and Jesus had been saying that there's going to be some pretty bad things happening in the world. Then it's going to be, and he, and he said, anguish. He called it anguish. He said, immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. And there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with mighty and great glory. And he will send out his angels with his mighty blast of a trumpet. And they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the heaven and the earth. If you read some of the things that it says in, in Matthew chapter 24, it's not easy to understand all of it. Some people have said, oh, that means this. He said, well, that's going to mean that. But he says this. Well, he, and then they say, so this can't happen till that. But then he went on to say in verse 36, he said, however, no one knows the day or hour that when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows when Jesus will come back into this world. He said, and when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets, parties, weddings, right up to the time of Noah entering into the boat. Jesus wanted to give kind of a picture, a mental picture, of what will be happening in the world. In 2 Peter, 
It said, and God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven sons of his family. Noah warned the people of the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he was destroying the world from godly people with a vast flood. People didn't realise what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. These are, these are difficult things to, to get into your heart. Except I, I read them, and again I hope it's not too, too complicated, but I read them and I step back and I say, Lord, we're in your hands my life is in your hands, but I know this, that in my life, you have given me life. You have transformed my life. You've revealed the truth, and the truth has made me free. And it has changed my conception, my perception of all of these things. So I look around, and I see what's happening. I do get disturbed sometimes. I do get very saddened sometimes. And when he said there, that he destroyed the world because the world was full of ungodly people. I don't really want to get into what I see around in the world today because I'm sure that you're fully aware of what's happening around the world. Except I'll say one thing, that, that the more I see, the more people want to push God and Jesus and anything to do with that out of the equation. That's irrelevant. That's what I said last week, wasn't it? About being a believer. Does it matter? Is it irrelevant or is it any, does it have any relevance? Is it true? These are truly chilling prophecies by Jesus himself. But I have to say this that for believers in Jesus, these prophecies that Jesus said, they hold no fear for us. And so I want to reassure you this morning that as long as your faith remains strong in Jesus, that your life is secure in him. That, that whatever happens, your life is secure in him. That we can stand confidently on the Bible and what it says. And going back to what I started with this morning is that when our lives come to an end, we shall see him as he really is. We'll see him in all his glory. And so whatever happens in the world, whether Jesus comes, whether, we're, whether our life comes to an end, I know this, that, that, that death doesn't end it all. But that just passes me through into the reality of knowing God and who he is. He, say, he says in John, it says, Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him for when we see him as he really is, when we see him, we'll be like him. In other words, that, that, that new life, that, that I can't get into the resurrection body today. We'll talk about it one day. But you know, when Jesus was resurrected, he had a different body. When we, and I'm not quite sure how this will work, you know, when, when, there's a, when the resurrection takes place and the spirits, I'm not quite sure how, because it doesn't say it. So I'm not going to make it up. I just know this, that, that those who have died in Christ will rise to meet him in glory. Praise his name. It said, if we die in faith, then we need to read this in Corinthians. We are confident in I say and willing rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that when we pass out of this world, no matter whether we, whether, whether we and, I, and I'm going to read something in a minute, but when we pass out of this world, no matter when that day is, I believe that there's no hanging about in limbo. I, I, that's not how I understand it. There, there, there's no kind of, of uh, that, no. I, I believe that when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, he said, you know, today... You'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say, well, you know, in a couple of thousand years, he said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. In, in Corinthians, it says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In Hebrews, it says, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us keep, let us strip off everything. And so I have this, this clear picture in my mind that when I leave this world and when, when my life comes to an end, I shall see Jesus as he really is. I'm going to read something now to finish. Re read, read some of these, uh, these passages. 
1 Corinthians 15, if you read the whole of that chapter, it gives you a bit of a, more of a thing. I ain't got time to read it. But, but Paul, the only thing I'd say before I read this bit is that, is that Paul wrote this in the ever-present context. It was the ever-present. So whoever reads it, when these things come to pass, he's, 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 he's wrote it in the, as if it was in the present. Okay. So he said, so let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30, 51. I want to reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. But we will all be transformed. He's writing it in the present. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye. When the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. That's the promise of eternal life. I was talking before about this body that we've got. You know, it gets a bit, a bit, bit threadbare, a bit, 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 bit difficult, you know, a bit achy. You know, if you read in Revelations, it said in, in heaven, it said there'll be no more death and no more aches and pains and no more sorrow, no more tears. You've got to so, much, so much to read about all of these things. But he said, our dying bodies, they can't live forever. They must be, be transformed into bodies that will never die. I can't understand that. That's a little bit weird to me, to, to have something that will never die, that will live for eternity, forever. But it says that our bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. And this is exciting. It says that death is swallowed up in victory. That's what happened when Jesus walked out of that tomb. Death was swallowed up in victory. And he says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? He said, for sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank be to God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise his name. I want to I I leap in my, I want my heart to leap when I read that. He, says, he said, this uh, victory over sin and death. So in the human sense of the word, you could say life and death, life, live it to the full, death, life comes to an end, that's the end of that, you know, thank you very much. But, but there's so much more to that. I had a conversation with somebody one time, and, and I'm sure that you've had a similar conversation, or you may have heard this before, you know, but, and, but I'll, 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 I'll preempt it by saying I, I don't believe that if we were to believe in God, it, Paul said, if we were just to believe in God through this life, you know, and all our faith was of no avail, and that when we died, we'd, we'd be men of most, uh, men most, um, what's that word? Miserable. miserable, thank you. Men of most miserable. So I preempt this by saying, saying that, but, but thanks be to God, the truth is in our hearts. But I had a conversation with somebody, and, and, we, and it went like this, you know, that if we, if we were, you don't believe it, I believe it. So should we die on the, first day, on the same day? And, should, and you be right. You know, then, then we, we both get lowered into the ground and that's the end of that. And it's, we just become dust and ashen. And, and we're finished and there is nothing at all after this life. You know, you're right. There is nothing out there. There's nothing after life. And we lower in the ground. That's the end of that. So if I'm right, you've chosen to not believe. Take the words of Jesus. He said, if you refuse to believe, then you will face a judgment which is not worth thinking. I don't even want to think about it. But, but we read about it in the Bible. And so that's your, that's your afterlife. But if I'm right, I go to that reward. I go to be with Jesus. I go to that eternal place in heaven with him. I go to all the things that he's promised me. I go to the place where he has, he has for the last 50 years reassured me that this is true, that it's right, that it's what he said in his word and I will have it and it's my inheritance and it's my experience and I'm going to go to that place and I'm excited and so death now isn't the end for me. It's the introduction to an eternal life that, that, has, that has led me to this place of being able to rejoice even though you come to the end of life. It's not, it's not fear. It's gone. It's been removed and I'm going to this and I'm excited about it but you... You're right, that's the end of it. That's the end of it. Are you willing to take that risk? 
they're still willing to walk away. So my dear brothers and sisters, he said, be strong and immovable in this faith. Don't let anything shake you away from this faith, from this foundation. And he goes on to encourage him and he said, always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. So, to finish, it would seem to me that not only does God bring great blessing into our earthly lives, but he's sorted our future, our eternity, and it's just something that I have run out of words to explain or to, or to describe, except I'll just say this. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did, for dying, for, for resurrecting from the dead, to ascend into heaven and just give me a little glimpse that you'll come back one day and when that day comes, should I be alive, I'll rise to meet you. If my life's over before then, then I will still be part of that amazing resurrection and will go on into that eternal glory to spend it with you. Can't think of anything better in life than that. Amen. Thanks, Bob. I don't know what to say to follow that. You know, like you, when you're leading, you think, oh, I should give like a little bit of a summary. And, but you know, that was an awesome word, really challenging. Again, we like being challenged, don't we? But just to sort of, uh, I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to try and add anything. It was really good. Thank you, Bob, for bringing that word to us. Let us not forget, because often as well, I'm thinking, you know, we're going to sing a song. We're going to have the notices. Don't let be, uh, anything distract you from the great word that we've just heard today. Um, so we're going to come and sing our last song together. And is Jill going to do the work, the um, notices? Isha, you give her a shout. We can do, yeah, we can do them after if she's not back in time. We're going to sing 10,000 reasons. There's more than 10,000 reasons to praise God from just what we've heard from today. But that's what we're going to finish with. And uh, we're going to take up our offering as we sing this last song together. Would you like to stand and join us, please?
message of Jesus, the message of Jesus that brings life, eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in you. you, Lord, the hope for today and the hope for tomorrow and the hope even after we've left this world. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just pray as we leave this place, Lord, you will really let the seeds of your word that have been planted in our hearts, Lord, today really continue to grow. Lord, as we press into you, Lord, as we water these seeds, as you, sorry, Lord God, you water the seeds, Lord, in our hearts. Oh, Lord, do something new. Show us more about you. Um, Change the way we live our lives. Give us confidence and boldness as we speak your message out into the lives of others, Lord God. Oh, Lord, it's so important, Lord, that we stand true to your gospel and Lord, we share that gospel with others. There has never been more of a day of that you are so relevant than now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Amen. So we'll just ask Jill. We're very honor, honored and privileged to have Jill with us um, today. She normally mixes with royalty now. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for people who didn't know, I did go to the palace on Tuesday for the garden party. (laughs) And they say, God, you know, he's completely changed my life. To the, you cannot say, five and a half years ago, I was sectioned in hospital. And today I went to the garden party. He completely and utterly changed my life to the best. Mm. That power of prayer people keep going on about really does work. Um, And it's been with me all week, but showing the love of Jesus through your actions, you don't have to throw a Bible at somebody, just be kind to them. You know, um, you don't know how much you can change someone's day. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Um, yeah, and I'm in awe sometimes of how my life has changed. So, And it's through the church, it's through God, and through Jesus becoming your friend. Because sometimes it's a very lonely place um, on the beginning of your journey. So, yeah, I didn't know I was going to get upset. <laughs> but yeah, it was unbelievable. Um, the whole year has been unbelievable. As being the mayoress, it's been absolutely, um, completely overwhelming. The support from the church, they didn't sap me, so that was great. Um, but it was, it was the show of the love of Jesus through our actions. And sometimes that kindness, you need it, because you don't know how bad that day's been for somebody. Um, and you look round, I mean, I was looking around London, and the, the sadness, we were having a brilliant day, and there was people passed out on the lawn, you know, and you just think how bad their day might have been. And I felt blessed, but then also... I did a silent prayer to bless them kind of thing, you know. And it's the silly stuff like we had food left. Don't bin it, give it somebody. <laughs> or, you know, it, uh, the, the homeless man was appreciated of it. You know, don't, it's the small things in life and you don't know how that can change somebody. So that's my little message because it stayed with, I printed one off and three came off as thought I'll take the hint. Um, but oh yeah, so I'll put it on the notice board. It's the small thing, saying hi to somebody who's maybe sat there lonely. They might have not spoke to anybody all day, you know? Just show that compassion, I think. So yeah, so that's my little thing. Let's start for next week, yeah? And now I'm back, so that's great. So on Monday, it's the nature walk. It isn't on there. I think it is full. She's now doing two a week, two a month now. One's a longer walk, if they're willing to do, and one's a shorter walk. The ones who run it is Susie. Um, it's Gavin and uh, Janice's daughter. Um, she's absolutely brilliant. She has the best way of pulling things out of you. 
and she's always on the hill shouting you up it you know when you're shattered at the bottom she's at the hill telling you to get up there so um if you ever just need a break or you've got a few hours spare the nature walks are brilliant and it's a good way to see the god's world you look around and think wow how beautiful it is so she takes us to some beautiful places so that is fantastic so on tuesday is coffee morning and prayer again the power of prayer i think i was on that list for a long time um, and they do work and it's the simple things pray about everything you know the little things became comes the big thing so yeah definitely so the cooking classes are on wednesday again we are full we're doing really well with that we've been completely blessed we've built loads of funding for the food and viv and jackie came on last again last week we did bull pork it was absolutely divine it was really good jacqueline's doing um if you don't know my sister completely off her head like the rest of us, but um, she really is seeing her right path and she really enjoys teaching. And, you know, even the older generation, our learning still and still, my mum even said, oh, I'll do that, you know, so please come on it. And then fellowship evening, I don't know where you're up to, where you're up to on fellowship. John. So if you've got a spare Wednesday, please come. And then Thursday, Bellies dot bins. Well, uh, what can I say? We are... 90 odd parcels a week now and we have started to scheme out i am praying for some um, um funding for this but we are up to offering a toilet selection you know like shampoo conditioner um these deodorants and things all for like a two pound donation but it's worth about four or five pound it's herbal essence i've bought sure we're working with a company called in kind so we can give these products out but at the current level we've got no funding so unfortunately we've got to pass that charge on to our consumers but i am praying that the funding will arrive and that means i mean we are still giving it out for free if people are struggling you know if they are struggling they are getting it for free but we want to bring that price down really if possible um, so that's really great. And then the soup, Joy comes and, the, you know, Ruth comes and joins us. And then Friday and Saturday, I actually am away on Saturday. So um, I will be back properly by next week, the weekend after. Um, and then Sunday service. So, yeah, so that's me. So thank you for everyone. Thank you, everybody. Um, in, the, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be handing a questionnaire out uh, because we really want our church to grow. We want it to go as a body. We want to know what you would like as a church as well. So um, putting together a questionnaire, just asking about what times you'd be available, what sort of things would really sort of excite you spiritually. Um, so I'm just giving you the heads up that that's going to be coming your way in a couple of weeks when I've finished tweaking a few questions. Uh, all right then. So I think, I think we're done. I think our birthdays, Thursdays. No, great, praise God. <laughs> I do collectively say we should just sing one happy birthday for the last of the year. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's go and have some drinks and toast and whatever else refreshment wise is on offer. Have a great week, everybody. Store that word in your heart that you've heard today. Amen. And thank you, Jill. She's amazing, isn't she? She's gone now, but she's pretty awesome, isn't she? Yeah. She's got it.